Hi, thanks, Bill. I'm uh, trying to get oriented here with the computer. <laughs> Sorry. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about deburring tonight, and uh, there, there's been a lot of questions on the phone lately about uh, you know getting started on the project and uh, deburring in general. How to know how much is too much, that kind of thing. So we're just going to go through some real basic deburring questions and. Uh, we certainly welcome feedback. We welcome questions. Uh, we welcome other techniques. If if you see something that I do here and you say, "Hey, I tried that," or you know, "I had a better idea," you know, that's what that's what this is all about: sharing ideas. So um, we're going to start uh, with a little bit of hole deburring um, and talk about what's important there, and then uh, move on to the wheel. And I have a live grinder here on the bench so that I can show that this time instead of um, in the last time we touched on it a little bit but um, that way you can see just how quick it is in case you're, you haven't started the building process yet um, there's a lot of deburring in the airplane but um, it really goes quite quick um, so with that uh, we'll start on the whole deburring uh, and I'm sorry let me back up there was a couple of questions that have been answered over the last couple weeks uh, some of them I posted onto the Google Plus page, and so um, Bill, I think, has that all categorized, and we'll, we'll work into that. So I think what we're going to do is, is talk about hole deburring first, and then see if there's any questions about that, and then move on to the, to the edge deburring after that. So um, let me switch cameras back, and that's what I was poking around with as we just started is trying to get my... Um, second camera here so that I could focus it manually. I know that I did that last time and I can't remember how. <laughs> um, okay, there's the zoom. Well, I guess we're just going to maybe let it, let it, oh wait, there's autofocus. Got it. Sorry for, for sorry for my fumbling. Okay, so we're going to save settings there, and I'm going to manually focus this at about four inches away. Okay, so first we're going to talk about hole deburring. And the easiest way to do the deburring on the holes is with a um, single hole deburring tool. Now, um, this is an example of the single hole deburring tool. The reason for this is the same as the three flute versus single flute countersinks we talked about in the last um, hangout. So if you go, if you didn't see that, go back to the uh, what would that be August uh, 2013 hangout on YouTube, and you can watch that about why the single flutes work better than the three flutes. And it really comes down to one cutting edge, uh, so that that cutting edge is on the material all the time. Uh, also, you'll notice on these. This, this is a, a piece of pre-punched skin. Let me see if I can bend the light around here. There we go. Right. Um, this is pre-punched, and you can see as I, as I line the reflection up with this, uh, this hole that it kind of bends around here, and that makes it obvious that that's the side that it was punched from. I'll flip it over, and you can see that there's a slight burr on the back side. That's the, obviously the side that it was... Um, the punch came through into the side and left a burr. So with the single flute deburring tool, um, you can just set that in the hole and turn it one revolution, one and a half revolutions or so, and that takes off that burr. Get back to the focus here. Um, so so that's really the all the, all it takes to deburr that hole. Now. One of the first things you do when you put your airplane together is you click all the parts together and you enlarge these holes, which also creates a burr. And then you have to deburr those um, from whichever side has a burr. Sometimes they, sometimes there's no burr uh, on the front side, and sometimes the burr's you know, quite heavy, depending on the speed of your drill, the the sharpness of your bit, how hard you were pushing. And the, the key is to remember when you're drilling aluminum, it's very soft material. And the faster you can turn the drill bit, because of the size of the hole, you want to turn it as fast as you can. And the slower you push on it, the more it allows the drill or the reamer to cut rather than to um, dig into the material or tear out the material. Hold on for just a second here. I'm going to mute my microphone. I'll be right back.
Okay, so sorry about that. I was just requesting another tool. DJ is going to go grab for me. Um, all right, so so this is the this is the pre-punched piece. Then I'm going to grab a reamer here, and I'm going to run a reamer through that hole. Bill, would you confirm that I am unmuted? Yep, I can, I can hear you great. Just wanted to make sure. Okay, so I'm going to run a reamer through this hole here to enlarge it out from a, the pre-punch number 43 to uh, number 40, which is what the reamer is. And then I switch drill bits here. And this top hole I'll then do with a drill. And we'll see if we can see if we can see the difference. Yeah, it's that's not gonna gonna show much difference. But a lot of times when you ream the hole, you will you will get very very little burr on the backside. We're I guess this one was the reamer, right? Um, versus the drill bit, which leaves kind of a tear out, which is more of a triangular shape hole. The drill bit makes it harder to deburr. So the better hole you can start out with, the easier it is to deburr. So again, it's just light pressure and just enough. Yeah, I felt just a little bit burr on just just enough so that when you drag your finger across it, the the burr does not catch in the skin of your fingerprint. So you'll still feel the hole, obviously, but you don't want to feel that burr. Now I'm turning this by hand just as an example to show you. But there are tools. The reason that we make it in a hex form like this with the quarter inch hex on the end is so that you can use it in a cordless screwdriver. And let me get the autofocus back on here. There we go. So you can use it in a cordless screwdriver. And what this does is, first of all, the tool is very lightweight. And this is this is a fairly old one. You can get lithium ion ones now that are that are smaller, lighter. The smallest, lightest one you can find is what you really want to use. Because you don't want to put much pressure, just like when you're drilling the material. You don't want to put much pressure down on the material. So if you're using an 18 volt cordless screwdriver, you can't tell how hard you're pushing on it versus a small cordless like this, or like I said, even a lighter one would, I, would be what I prefer. Um, you can just start turning and just go along and touch and pull. And that's all it takes. And then let me see if it'll focus this close up. I think it has better luck if I put my fingers in there. Yeah, you can see that there's not much material that's been removed off of that, just enough to take away that burr. And so what you're doing if you over deburr, I guess I can do an example of this. This isn't going on an airplane or anything. If you just really use too much pressure, you bear down on it, you go to the other side, you deburr that one with too much pressure, you, you can imagine that in the middle here, let me focus again, sorry. Bill, we got to get a different webcam. Um, yeah, it's not focusing on anything now. There we go. So you can see that that has started to countersink that sheet. Well, when you countersink a piece of 25 thousandths material like this from one side, say 10 thousandths deep, and from the other side 10 thousandths deep, you only have 5 thousandths in the middle that is not countersunk. So you end up with kind of a knife edge in there, which is asking for a crack to start. The reason we deburr to start with is to um, eliminate stress points where a crack might start. So you want to just very lightly use the tool, and, and you shouldn't be countersinking much, just enough that, that when you run your finger across it, you don't feel it. Now this, of all time, this is my favorite deburring tool. This is called a Craftsman Mini Driver. And about the time I fell in love with it, I um, tried to get them from Craftsman, and they quit making them. So the reason I like this is it's so lightweight. I, it's hard to show on video, right? But 
Um, it has a little button here, and you can just hold it down and go along each hole. The battery's about dead because I've used it so much, right? But um, but it's really nice, really lightweight, really easy to use, but I just cannot find anything like this anymore. It also has a hot swappable battery, not hot swappable, but swappable battery so that you can put one in the charger and <clears throat> use um, use one at the same time, which is pretty important as you get going along. Uh, this one, for instance, when it runs out of battery, uh, you plug it in and wait for it to charge up. So if you can find one with interchangeable batteries, that's great. But really, weight is the is the key. That's what you want to look for. I'm going to try and handheld this a little bit and hope it doesn't get too um, wobbly. This this tool is is a um, I don't know what you what you even call it uh, a deburring tool. This one my dad made um, as he was building the RV4, and it's similar to the ones you see for sale now that that you wobble around like this. And they work just fine. Uh, we call them the carpal tunnel tool because you have 14,000 rivets in the airplane. And you have two pieces per rivet and two sides per piece. So that's uh, what 56,000 um, wobbles of your hand as you're using this tool. And that's why we like the we like the cordless one a lot better than that. Um, hole deburring. I think, I think that pretty much covers the deburring. Oh, I'll touch on it again. I talked about it in the last webinar. One of the things that I like to do is is just use the reamer to enlarge the hole. Uh, very very fast RPM, very slow feed rate through the material, and then there will not be any burr on the front side when doing this. And then on the back side, you can literally just wipe the burr off with Scotch Brite. If you use a sharp reamer and um, low uh, push it slowly with uh, high RPM. So um, that's my preferred method. But sometimes you'll still get a little bit of burr and have to come back with the with the deburring tool and give it a quick turn to take that off. So I'd like to open up to any questions now about hole deburring if you have any. Sorry, Paul mentioned here that uh, he finds better touch with the hand deburr tool. So probably just probably just a, uh, you you uh, can you can definitely feel it better, and that's why that's why I'm stressing the lightness of the tool, um, because if and maybe he's talking about the uh, the wobble around tool. Um, I'm not sure, but I find that you end up pressing too hard with the with the hand tool to get it to go around, and and you end up taking too much off. Now, if you take a tool like this and turn it in your hand, you can absolutely feel feel it better than in the power tool, but again, I just, um, I would rather get the the procedure down so it's the same each time, touch each hole, and, and then you can make a lot of progress rather than, than fussing with each hole, I guess. Um, Paul, do you have a technique that, that you can expand on there that you, that you like to use and want to share? Um, he said it shouldn't see any reflect, reflected surface edge or deburn too much. Yes. Um, well, if you're talking about the, it, you know, it, it really depends on how, how close you're, you're looking or you're able to look. Um, i trying to find one that I've done here, just a second. I mean, if you're looking at it under magnification, you're always, if you deburred it, you're always going to see some amount of countersink. Um, like, like this one here is, uh, oh, come on, camera. Trying to shield the rest of the shot so it focuses. There we go. That, that one I would call quite good actually, um, but if you're starting to see a countersink like this up here, then yeah, you're doing something wrong. You're putting too much pressure or too many rotations on it. Is that what you're saying, Paul? And feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to talk rather than type. Yeah, so um, he said yes, no countersink, just one and a half turns on the hand deburr tool. Okay, so hand deburr tool, are you talking about this type of tool? Are you talking about turning it by hand? 
we we actually started out in the RV4 using a drill bit, turning it by hand, and uh, quickly discovered that wasn't the way to do it. So, so if uh, if folks are on a uh, laptop or desktop, there's a red um, microphone in the upper right hand corner. And if you'd like to ask a question live, you can go ahead okay. and click that. Yeah, I see Paul's response, and and I think. Now that I think about it, for YouTube users, we should probably echo the, the chats. So, um, yeah, he says, yes, no countersink, just one and a half turns on the handy burring tool. And then he followed up my question um, with, was it like this tool? And he says, yes, with the hand tool, but smaller. So, so that's Paul's opinion. Of, he, he likes to, to do it by hand because he gets a better quote, touch, unquote, with the handy burr tool. So, any other questions or comments about that? The handy burr tool's batteries don't ever go dead, too. That's that's one advantage there. And it looks like, it looks uh, like uh, we just had Tom. Just had Tom, 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 Tom. Hi, Tom. Tom's from Genuine Aircraft Hardware. I think I'm going to move on to edge deburring here. And we talked about this in one of the last two Hangouts. Um, I'm going to have to go back to manual focus. Bear with me a second. See how close this baby will get. All right, so here we see a piece of Vans material has been punched with their punch press. And you can see that about every inch on this piece, I suppose it varies on, on other pieces. Well, that nub, the easiest way to get rid of those nubs before you do anything else to, to the edge is to run along it with a file. And while I have it focused here, using the macro lens, you can see quite clearly the rough edge where it... Um, it almost looks like a piece of tile that's been broken. And so those are the kind of places that as this piece uh, flexes and moves, it's possible to start a stress crack. Now, I don't want to alarm anyone into over deburring because that seems to be the biggest problem is overdoing it. But uh, when, when they say in the first few pages of your plans to deburr the edges, that's what they're talking about is just getting rid of some of that junk there. And it's really quite easy and quite fast to do. I'm going to try and zoom out a little bit more, or focus out. There, that's about right. And so what I'm going to do here is just take a file, and I'm going to run the file squarely along the edge of the aluminum. And what that's doing is knocking off those nubs where one tool meets the other tool. So I'm just going to quickly knock those off. And if I was looking at the piece rather than the camera picture, that would have been much quicker. And I just I just did a 45 on each side to kind of knock those off a little too. So the next thing, now my deburring tool is gone out of my toolbox, but that's okay. the 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 hook tool that you drag along the edge I also showed last time, where you where you do that in a couple different directions. Um, so, so that would probably be my second step, is just dragging that along the edge. And then I would move over to the wheel. And that's, that's really one of the things I wanted to show tonight, is <laughs> we, we tend to get defective wheels on our stuff. You know how it works. So uh, rather than throwing it away, we, we use the defective product. So your wheel should look a lot nicer than the big chunks out of the side of this one. All right, so let me, there we go. Focus in there, and what I'm going to do then is I'm going to run the sheet along the edge at an angle. The reason that I do that, as I mentioned uh, before, is if you run the sheet along an edge like this, you will create a groove. And sometimes that groove's a little bit handy, but it ends up wearing the wheel out really quickly. So if you keep the material um, at oh, a 30 or 45 degree angle this way, as well as at an angle this way, you get your best performance out of the wheel and you keep your edge, the edge of your wheel more square. So I'm going to, um, actually let me back up just a little bit here, try that. 
so I'm going to go along and I'm going to just brush the edge, very light pressure. Um, I'll try and try and just keep a couple fingers on here so you can see how light a pressure I'm using. Once along one side, flip it over. Once along the other side. And then I kind of just feel it with my fingers. You don't even really have to look at it. Just feel it with your fingers. And see, if, see if it needs any more. If it does, just hit it another time. Now, we have this wheel is in our kit. Um, it's the one that Van recommends for deburring. We also have what we call the light deburring wheel, which is a gray wheel, and it's a softer wheel. So your two options for the, the if that was the third step, this would be the fourth step. Your two options for the fourth step then would be to just really quickly drag the scotch bright around on the corner, and then that's cleaned up. Or you can come to this light deburring wheel which is a lower density and a finer grit. And then just do the same thing again. You can do it square with the edge if you want, but then that, that is just perfectly smooth. And when you drag your finger along, if there's nothing that catches in the skin of your fingerprint. Um, this wheel, the light deburring wheel, Trade us around here a little bit, and I'll turn the autofocus back on as well. So the light deburring wheel, um, it will do polishing um, where it takes these fine, fine, fine burrs off the edge that are left by the other wheel, but it will not do material removal. So if you have a piece that has serrations in it from a bandsaw or snips, uh, this will just polish the tops of those, and you'll still see them where the tool or the wheel that, that comes in our kit and is sold by Vans is a harder, uh, more dense wheel. hope I'm not making anybody seasick. Um, so it's a harder, denser wheel, and it will remove material. So, again, if I want to take this piece and I want to round this edge, let's say this is an inspection plate, I can come up to this wheel... I'm moving it around on the wheel not, as to not make a groove in it. Okay. But I can actually uh, shape shape a part with this wheel. And then uh, we'll see if we can get it to do it. No, <laughs> is the answer. Um, there's a there's a bit of a burr that that's pushed onto the edge of here, and and certainly on the back side. Oh, there we go. So you can see that burr on the back side, and you can see that little corner on the front side. So when I take it to this wheel, again, you could do this with the scotch bright hand pad, but when you take it to this wheel, it's just quick and easy to get rid of that burr. And again, you want to make sure that as you look at it from an end view, I'll try here, uh, that you're not sharpening that edge. You, you still want to see a flat Oh, that was, for a moment, that was a really good focus. Uh, you still want to see that square edge all the way around the corner, so you're just deburring the outside edge. Uh, so that's kind of the differences in the two-wheel. From a, from a technical standpoint, the way they make the harder wheel, or the most common wheel, the, we call it the cut and polish wheel here, is this is a, 3M's number is a 7A medium. And what that what that does is they take seven inches of material and they compact it down into the one inch of wheel. So that's what gets makes it a pretty dense wheel. And then the medium is just the grit. <clears throat> the A is the aluminum oxide wheel. You can see right there, 7 a.m. Um, this, this one does not is not stamped like that. But this is a two, um, and it's a fine. So instead of taking seven inches of material and squishing it down, they take two. So so it's it's much. I just wish that there was a way to show you. It's it's much softer, um, more like a dried out loofah sponge, um, and it's a fine grit, so it doesn't take as much off. So that's what I wanted to share about the wheels. Is there any questions about those before we move on? So it looks like we had. A couple new folks in the room here, so if you want to just click on the chat window in the upper corner of the hangout screen, the hangout screen. Um, a chat window will open and you can type your questions in there. 
It looks like Wesley has been having some trouble. I hope he's figured out how to get back on or is watching it on YouTube. Looks like he's been on and off. Yeah, I'm here. I'm having connectivity issues. Oh, you're there. Okay. So so you are you are able to watch. That's good. So does anybody have any questions about the wheels or how to use them or when you use them, why you use them, anything like that? Okay. Uh, Bill, to answer your question, I don't hear an echo when you talk, so it sounds good from my end. Um, I will guess I'll move on to drilling out a rivet. We had a customer call earlier in the week that wanted to see that done, so bear with me just a moment while I force my camera to focus here. Okay, I guess that's about as good as it gets. So I set some rivets um, just specifically to drill out. And grab the right drill bit here. So what I'm going to do here is this is, an, this is a 332nd rivet. It's um, originally drilled with a number 40 drill bit. It's originally dimpled with a standard dimple die. And then it's set. So, so when you when a dimple is made, it opens up that original hole bit, and then when the rivet is set, it fills that hole back in. So what we're going to do is we're still going to take a number forty bit, same size, and we're going to drill about the depth of the rivet head here. Once that's done, uh, we can pop the head off and finish rib finish drilling down through the rivet um, to take the rivet out. So. Hey Mike. Hey Mike. Go ahead. Um, we have one question. Uh, Lee's got a question uh, that he asked about sharpening the reamer. So I just want to be sure that uh, because we just jumped off of the deburring stuff, that we can answer that real quick. That real quickly. Okay. Um, what about sharpening the reamer? I'm not seeing it. So through the new Q&A app, and he's asking if um, you can sharpen the reamer after it gets dull. Technically, yes. <laughs> How to do it, I I don't know. I it, you know if you use a if you're really good at sharpening stuff, you could use a stone, and you could really carefully run it along the stone. But it, that's nothing that I've ever done. Um, when we started selling number thirty and forty reamers, which was you know sometime around when the the matched hole pre punched seven RV seven came out. Uh, we we gave them to some of the local guys that built a lot, and we said, "Use these. Tell us what you think. Give us some feedback." And you know, they used them and loved them, but they never wore them out. It wasn't. It's not like a drill bit that that is bouncing around in the hole and chattering, causing that sharp edge to get beaten up. Um, the reamers are really designed to do this, and as far as I know, in aluminum, um, in one airplane, people just don't wear them out. Um, so that's that's another good thing about the reamers, and they have four cutting flutes on them versus two, <clears throat> so that you know that makes them last even longer. Cool, cool. All right, thank All right. you. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm you know I'm sure there are places that sharpen them, but that's that's all I know about it, I guess. So every rivet has this um, this divot in the center of it, and what what we want to do, oh, I forgot about one of the other questions. Um, excuse me a second. DJ, could you run in and get a large diameter uh, split point bit, like a half inch or 716 or something? Um, I'm just going to go ahead and do this while she's doing that, but there's a divot in the center of each one of these, and I'm using a split point bit to drill this out, and I'll explain that here in just a minute when she gets back with the bit. But So I'm finding that divot um, and I'm trying right now to put a side load on the, the drill, and it's not wanting to slip off, so I know it's in the right spot. So I'm going to lay this down on the bench, because it's the only way I can really do it. And I'm going to start by giving the chuck just a couple turns to get it going and make sure that that, that uh, drill bit gets going right in the middle. That just helps you out. Um, 
Now, as I'm drilling it, I'm going to be constantly chasing it toward the center. So if it's trying to drill off to the side a little, I'm going to chase it back. And also, uh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to drill rel relatively slow. Normally, in aluminum, you want to drill, turn as fast as you can and push, uh, not push very hard. This is kind of the opposite. You want to push and go fairly slow. This is where you want to drill with a nice trigger. And I'm pushing I would, what I would call medium. I'm not pushing hard. You can see the chips coming off aren't huge, nasty chips, but they aren't just powder either. So I'm chasing this toward the middle all the time. Now I've drilled out the rivet head. You see the head has come off on the end of the bit. Am I in, I'm not in autofocus. Hold on a second. Let's try that. Yeah, so there you see that the, the actual rivet head is on the end of the drill bit. Normally I like to drill just through the head, but um, not have it come off on the drill bit. And then I leave the drill bit in the hole and kind of rock it back and forth a little to snap it off. That just ensures that you're not drilling deep enough to get into the aluminum itself. So there's a shot of drilling down just deep enough to get through the head. And then I'm going to go ahead and finish drilling. You can probably punch this out with a punch, which is what a lot of people will tell you to do. I don't like that technique because I don't like ever hitting the, uh, the airplane. I figure that's just a great, great opportunity for a dent. So I just go ahead and drill it out, and sometimes it just falls out as you start to drill it. And sometimes it doesn't. Okay, so there... I've drilled it out, and I've done it without enlarging the original hole at all. It feels like the rivet's still on the back side. I guess not. There is what the tail looks like. Ah, come on. Let's see if I can get up there. <laughs> I wish this camera was at least predictable. Well, anyway, the tail, you can see, has just a little skin around the outside of it um, where the drill bit has drilled into the tail but not hardly touched the outside. So that's what you want to do when you drill a rivet out um, to, keep it, to keep it from enlarging the hole and to keep from using an oops rivet, which is, I think I have some behind me here. I do not. Um, an oops rivet has the standard 332nd head, but it has the shank for an eighth inch. So if that was elongated, you could use a number 30 reamer or a number 30 drill bit. And you could, you could enlarge this. I don't have, have a call it on this particular reamer, but you could enlarge it to a number 30 and then use a oops rivet in there. It would still look like a 332, but it would have the tail of an eighth inch. So. That can come in handy if you really mess one up good, and it won't be obvious on the exterior when you're done. Okay, so let me go back to manual focus, and let's look at the end of this drill bit. This is what I was talking about, about a split point bit. And um, I tried explaining this over the phone to somebody the other day and wasn't very successful, so hopefully he's on here, or we'll watch it later on YouTube. Okay, that's a pretty good angle right there. So you see that with a standard S-point bit, you would have this facet here and the op opposing facet over here. But they would come clear, clear out here to where the web of the drill bit would end. And what that ends up with is a, a flat spot on the end of the drill bit right across here. With a split point bit, they, they come in at another angle and they cut this facet, sorry, this facet in here at another angle. And what that does is the, the standard point of the bit, which is here, comes up and it meets that split point right at the very center. And so what you end up with is an absolute point which is really difficult to show, but it's an absolute point on the end of there. So when you when you lay that on a surface, 
like the surface of your rivet that you don't want it to move, it stays exactly in that place that you that you lay it down on instead of doing the, the wandering swirl across there. And that's why, first of all, it's why you want to use split point bits on aluminum is because then you don't have to center punch the aluminum, which then makes a dent around your work. But it also allows you to to place it right in a given point like that divot in the middle of the rivet and uh, stay there instead of instead of walking around and trying to chase it around. So that's my spiel about drilling out rivets. Somebody asked about drilling out rivets in ProSeal. Um, don't is the <laughs> only advice I have for that. Um, I, I know that there was, there was a few that were tipped sideways, I believe, in Bill's explanation. And uh, if, there, if there's a way to put some masking tape around it, maybe, and use a really fine tooth file and file the top down, uh, that's the way I would go, rather than drilling out a rivet and pro seal, because it's essentially all glued together. And uh, it's just the, the chips are going to be a problem. It's just not, a, not something to do if you can absolutely help it. Are there any questions about that and drilling out rivets? Um, so I think there was one question that came in about um, about wheels. So Jeff asked, on the edges, sometimes even after using the wheel, there are small lines on the edges themselves. Do we need to polish all the edges? To a, to a mirror finish, finish or is or it most is mostly, is mostly smooth, smooth enough? Um, mostly smooth enough. Uh, if you ever call Vans and ask them for their opinion on deburring, they'll you know give their standard answer, which is just build the airplane. Uh, don't worry too much about spending too much time doing it. They, there, you know, there are places that stresses are concentrated and if you have a nick from you know something I'll see if I can create one <laughs> of course on the fly I can't right but uh, maybe maybe like if you had a nick that you made with a with a box knife or something that type of a nick but especially that started at the edge and, and worked around to the corner, that's the kind of thing that as it flexes, it can start a crack. But I, I just, I think as long as you just quickly take treatment on the edges that, that you're not going to have, you're not going to have problems with that. If, if you work it and work it and work it to be perfectly smooth, you're, you're definitely not going to have a problem with that, but it takes a long, long time to get every surface to look like that. And especially in places um, let me see if I can find a rib real quick. Especially in places that are like on the inside of a, a double flange, you just can't get in there. Um, here's a good example. Um, there's a lot of these, and you're like, how do you get? How do you get that? How do you deburr that? It, it, it's very difficult. You can use the um, hooked deburring tool, like this and get down in there and drag it around the corner um, and then come back with scotch Bright and drag it through there. And that's about all you get um, unless anybody wants to share another technique. Um, one of the worst things you can do is I wasn't looking at the camera. Was any of that in the shot? Yep, you got it. Yep, you got it. Okay. Um, the worst thing you can do is in an area like this go, oh, well, there's a burr there. I'm going to come up to the wheel. Ah. Got it, right? Let's see if we can get that in focus now. That's, I haven't even looked at it directly yet, but I know what it's going to look like. Bear with me while I play with the focus here. Okay, see how that has removed half of the material on those edges? And those are actually creating those stress cracks. So you know, you can really overthink it, you can really overdo it. The The object is to just get it as smooth as you can with, with a reasonable amount of time. If you tried to get down in there with the wheels, um, I think you're going to do more, more damage than good. Um, now that a lot of the, the flanges are tabbed construction rather than flutes 
you know, every, you know, three holes or so, you're going to have a lot of these things just like this. And let me see if I can hold it steady and look what I'm doing. Just running the deburring tool down here, around the corner, and then back up the outside. I think I got it pretty good. Um, is about all you want to do there. Because if you, like I said, if you get in there with the wheel, it's it's really going to do more harm than good. And then I showed a second ago, but you can also just feed your scotch right through and just drag it once through there to, to kind of clean up any light burrs left over by the, the hook. And I'd move on and build the next piece. Does that answer your question? I think it does. Think it, it, does. Wasn't, it wasn't. Um, okay. um, it was a it question was a posted on the G Plus page. page. OK. Any other questions about wheels? I have some beautiful holes here for examples. Not sure where this came from, but <laughs> that was probably that was my probably demo. My demo. What, what, what do you do when you have a hole like this? <laughs> Pop quiz, Bill. <laughs> I I don't have a clue. <laughs> that one you'd probably end up drilling out with an eighth inch drill and using an oops rivet to fill the hole back up. Yeah, you, you know you could count that as one in every eight bad ones, but. Yeah, that's that's pretty bad. This must have this is oh, this is a rib from one of the practice kits. Oh, let me get the focus back on. This is one of the ribs from one of the practice airfoil kits, so must have been a student who was working on that. It must not have been me, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What other questions do you guys have? While well, we're here. There was a, a comment or a suggestion, I guess, more than more than anything else on uh, the phone earlier this week. And I know I had put that in the Google Plus page, but I don't have that uh, up in front of me. Of a guy who who uh, did the face seal seal method on his tanks rather than um, the popsicle stick smear it on method. Um, so he bought a cheap Chinese made. Um, I don't know if it was a Semco type gun or what it was, but it was, it was some kind of a, a <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, he, one of the things that that impressed me is he said that it takes all the pressure off of it. You know, you mix up this Pro Seal and you have a couple hours to work with it, and it's getting in your eyebrows and and is you know a problem to work with. You're trying to smear it on with popsicle sticks, but not you know where it's not supposed to be. And, and by doing it this way, where it was very controlled, you had this eighth-inch bead all the way along the, uh, the rib flange uh, to um, what they're working on and what they're having trouble with and what they're having successes with. So. All right. Well, I thank all you guys for joining. And, um, yeah, just keep your questions coming, I guess, for next time. We we'll try to do these once a month. and. Um, this is the end of the month. Hopefully, we'll get a little little earlier in the month um, before the. Once again, I'll just echo Mike's sentiment here. Uh, thanks everybody for joining. Um, the recording of the video should be up on the Cleveland Tool YouTube page uh, here shortly. And uh, just so everybody knows, we do um, we did begin posting all of our YouTube videos on the Cleveland Tool website, so that's available in a link called Video Help in the upper right-hand corner. So um, I think that wraps it up. So thanks, everybody, for joining, and we'll see you next month. Yep. Good night.